Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Halton Catholic District School Board's Parent Involvement Committee, CPEC, presentation of cyberbullying and electronic safety. My name is Josh Daverstein. I'm the chair of the of CPEC. With me is Lisa Koster. She is the past chair of CPIC. Also with me is Rosemary Stagg and Barb Belanger and CPIC members that are helping me out tonight. Um, our presentation tonight is by Ryan Broll. He is a PhD candidate in the Department of Sociology at the University of Western Ontario and a research associate, associate at the CAMH Centre for Prevention Science. Ryan's research focuses on, on youth technology use and unhealthy relationships in the digital world. His most recent studies examine how parents, educators, and police officers present and respond to cyberbullying. While Ryan is presenting, um, there is no opportunity for you to voice your questions, but you can certainly ask questions by typing away in the bottom right-hand corner where you see questions. As you ask questions, um, either if you have a technical question or a question for Ryan, we will collate those and we will ask Ryan, if, Ryan a few questions at the end. Um, if there is a lot of questions, we will have the opportunity to email those to Ryan and he can email those, the answers back to us. Also, please note that tonight's session is being recorded and will be available on Halton CPIC's uh, YouTube page at a future date where other webinars are recorded there as well. So without much further ado, I'd like to hand the microphone over to Ryan. Thank you, Josh, and um, thank you very much for having me here this evening, and uh, thank you for everybody who come for coming out on uh, what's a lovely night out there. Um, so I hope this will be worth your while. Uh, so I'll be speaking a little bit about cyberbullying and electronic safety and a few things that we can do as parents to help protect our children in uh, these new digital environments. So the goal of this webinar uh, is to examine youth technology use, to explore what uh, specifically cyberbullying is, and some warning signs that parents can watch for that might indicate that their children uh, are involved in cyberbullying. We will also briefly explore teen sexting, and um, towards the end, uh, I will also provide uh, parents with some tips and strategies that come from the research that can be used to help keep children safe in our modern and always connected world. So hopefully by the end of this webinar, um, you will feel better equipped to protect and support your children as they navigate a world that is increasingly consumed by cell phones, the internet, and social media. I always like to begin with this little did you know because I think it puts things into context. Uh, young people especially but adults as well are increasingly likely to be a member of at least one social networking website. So did you know the combined populations of China, India, and the United States, which of course are the three most populated countries in the world, is about 2.92 billion people. So that's quite a number of people. Uh, in comparison, much smaller number, but ABC, CBS, and NBC are three very popular American TV networks. Every single month they get combined 28 million unique visitors to their websites. And this has gone up recently with the number of um, you know, television programs and other content being moved online, or at least being available online. These three networks have been around for a combined 200 years, so they're getting a large number of visitors and they've been around for a large amount of time. When we compare that to Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook, we see that the number of unique monthly visitors, so that's different people visiting those three websites every single month is 2.96 billion people. So that number, of course, absolutely dwarfs the number of visitors to uh, the three major American TV networks websites, and it's also higher than the populations of the three most populous countries in the world. So just in a 
very short amount of time, these things have become absolutely massively popular and important in our lives. And in fact, oh, I think, oh, sorry about that. I went backwards there. And none of these websites existed 10 years ago. So in you know less than a decade, Facebook just turned 10. In a decade, these have become that popular that quickly. As adults, we often recognize that what we put online has the potential to be accessed by anyone. Although we are seeing some improvements, many young people still do not understand this. So uh, just keep that in mind as I show this video clip here. Wow. So although it's, um, I mean, it's very unlikely that a mind reader will be accessing our information, we do know that employers and university and college admissions officers regularly Google names before they make a job offer or an admission offer. What we put online is accessible. We all must be aware of our digital footprint and as adults, it's particularly important for us to help educate young people and our children about what should and should not be posted online. As stated by Drew Altman, the president and CEO of the Kaiser Family Foundation, which is an organization that does a lot of work in this area, the amount of time young people spend with media has grown to where it's even more than a full-time work week. When children are spending this much time doing anything, we need to understand how it's affecting them for good and for bad. In addition, research conducted by the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, shows that by the time young people graduate from high school, they will have spent about 15,000 hours with media and only 12,000 hours in the classroom. When youth are using media to this extent, which is about the same amount uh, as a full-time job each week, it is our responsibility as adults and parents to help them use it appropriately and also to help them understand what they are doing with media and the implications that their digital decisions can have, uh, particularly down the road. 
So it's probably not a surprise to many adults and certainly to parents that young people spend a great deal of time engaged with technology. On average, uh, young people use about nine hours of technology per day. So this includes time spent on the computer, watching television, listening to music, and playing video games. However, this number doesn't account for multitasking, such as watching television while chatting on the computer. If each of these activities were separated out um, one by one, young people would spend more than 11 and a half hours per day with media. Furthermore, this figure doesn't does not include texting and the average young person spends about an hour and a half per day texting. So when you consider that our children are in school for about six or seven hours per day and hopefully sleeping at least eight hours per day, along with their technology use there really isn't much time for anything else. Almost all Canadian teenagers now have access to the internet um, and this access is often via portable devices. In fact, laptops, tablets, and cell phones are the most common ways to connect for all students. As technology becomes more portable though, it also becomes more difficult for parents to monitor, which I'm sure many of you um, are, are well aware of. While it's still a good idea to keep computers in common areas of the house whenever possible, this goal was much easier to accomplish when people still had large bulky desktop computers and often only one of them in the house. It's much more difficult now. By grade 11, almost all students have their own cell phone, often purchased for them by a parent. However, half of all grade 7 students and a quarter of grade 4 students also have their own cell phone. These rates of cell phone ownership represent absolutely extraordinary increases from 2005 when only 6% of students in grade 4 and 46% of students in grade 11 had their own cell phone. So. Uh, what that suggests is that issues related to cell phone use that parents of 16 and 17 year olds had to deal with less than a decade ago are now being faced by the parents of 12 and 13 year olds. And of course, almost all of these cell phones today are smartphones. In addition, I, I just want to point out that parents should be aware that texting is possible on cell phones even without a texting plan by using apps like Text Plus and WhatsApp. Um, so even things like iPods that don't have a texting plan um, or don't have the ability to text, you can text on those via these apps. Cell phone ownership is also affecting sleep patterns. 39% of students who have cell phones sleep with their phone in case they receive a call or message during the night. This trend of sleeping with one's phone increases to more than half of grade 11 students, but what I find quite shocking is that 20% of grade 4 students sleep with their cell phone in case they get an important call or message during the night. Lastly, young people's perceptions of the risks associated with technology seem to diminish rather than strengthen over time. A 2013 survey of almost 5,500 Canadian students in grades 4 to 11 asked students whether or not they can be hurt by talking to strangers online. Although 80% of 8th grade students said yes, only 63% of 11th grade students said yes. So as parents, we need to remember to reinforce messages about electronic safety even to our older children. The current generation of young people is often referred to as Generation Me, but uh, tonight I'm going to suggest that perhaps Generation Social would be a more appropriate title. More than 80% of 12 to 17 year olds have at least one social networking profile and 22% of teens check their social networks at least 10 times per day. Interestingly, about 32% of students in grades 4 to 6 have a Facebook account, even though Facebook's own terms of service require members to be at least 13 years of, years of age to have an account. And by grade 11, 95% of Canadian teens have a Facebook account and YouTube is, Canada, is uh, Canadian youth's favorite website across all grades and genders. So clearly social media is 
popular. In addition, 63% of teens send at least one text message daily, and only 1% of teens send less than one message per week. Uh, in addition, the average 12 to 17 year old teenager will also send about 5,000 text messages per month, and not surprisingly, uh, I'm sure to most people, older teenage girls between the ages of 14 and 17 are the most prolific texters. Contrary to common belief though, young people are not talking to strangers online. Instead, almost all of the time that young people spend talking to others online is spent talking to their real world friends. For many young people, hanging out with friends and developing a sense of identity online is commonplace. Everything posted, linked, liked, uploaded, tweeted, pinned, etc. has been very carefully constructed by youth to create their identity or what they want others to perceive them as being. Research shows that youth are becoming increasingly dependent on the feedback that they receive from their socially networked peers. In addition, research also shows that while youth love posting about themselves, they have unfriended others who post too many selfies or updates, and selfies are uh, pictures that somebody takes of him or herself and, and posts online. So the problem is that with all the identity creation online, the viewers or the consumers sometimes forget that what they are seeing on someone else's Facebook page, for example, is a construction as well. All too often youth see someone else posting pictures that show happiness, fun, excitement, etc. And they want to have the same and they think that there's something wrong with their life when they aren't experiencing those same situations. But it's easily forgotten that people only post the things that they want others to see or know, not the stuff that they don't want others to see. So what it becomes about is microfame. The concept of microfame hinges on the idea of viralness. Uh, as it isn't just what is produced and presented online, but also encompasses the audience's reaction and ongoing response. So if you post a picture, how many likes or comments can you get? If you post a video, how many hits and shares? How many people search it? Essentially, microfame uh, relates to when both the subject and the fans or the viewers participate directly in the celebrity's creation. So it extends beyond a creator's body of work to include a community that leaves comments, publishes reaction videos, sends emails, and builds up this internet reputation with links. For many parents, how their children actually use technology, and especially social media, is a bit of a mystery. And I understand that there's a lot of information on this slide, but what I really want to reiterate with this um, particular slide is that not all technology is bad. When used appropriately, technology and social media can provide young people with opportunities to share, express, um, and talk in ways that just weren't possible even a decade ago. Such opportunities allow young people to explore and form their identities on their own and with their friends, to develop strong civic values, and to engage in social issues, and to become active producers of knowledge rather than passive recipients of content. So to be sure, some people make poor choices when they're using technology, and that goes for young people and adults. But many youth have had profoundly positive experiences with technology. Almost 40% of Canadian teens have used social networking tools to share a story or piece of artwork they've created themselves, and the internet can be a powerful means of encouraging social engagement. For example, half of all students have gone online to find information about news and current events, and half of students in grades 7 to 11 have sent links to news stories to other people. 75% of teens have used the internet to find information about news, health issues, and relationships, and 35% have joined or supported an activist group online, such as Students Against Bullying or Free the Children. Many young people recognize the values of disconnecting from technology. 
94% of all students have chosen to unplug in order to do other things like spend more time with friends and family, enjoy quiet time by themselves, or go outside. And among 13 to 17 year olds, their favorite way to communicate with friends is in person. When asked why this was the case, 38% of teens said that it's more fun, and 29% said they can understand what people mean better. At the same time, young people should not be expected to understand social relations and safely navigate the electronic world all of the time. A powerful comparison uh, has been made between vehicles and computers, cell phones and tablets. Most would agree that a car is a powerful and dangerous piece of technology, so before we allow a teenager to drive, they must attend classes, pass tests, and they usually practice with a parent. However, when we hand a young person a cell phone or a laptop or a tablet, which is also a very powerful and dangerous, or potentially dangerous piece of technology, we simply tell them to be fun and, or to have fun and be safe. As parents, we need to do a better job of actually teaching young people how to use technology safely. Fortunately, 84% of Canadian students in grades 4 to 11 report that they have household rules about their online activity. Most commonly, these rules relate to not posting their contact information online, not talking to strangers, and avoiding certain websites. Interestingly, girls are more likely than boys to have household rules in place regarding their technology use, especially about not talking to strangers and not posting their contact information online. I think this brings up really interesting issues regarding the regulation of female behavior, which we won't talk about in detail today, other than to suggest that it is important for parents to work equally hard to keep their sons and daughters safe in the digital world. As is appropriate, the average number of household rules drops across grade levels, so as students get older, they have fewer rules. For example, compared to grade 4 students, 45% fewer grade 11 students have a rule for telling parents about things that happen online that make them uncomfortable, and 45% uh, fewer have a rule about avoiding certain websites. On the other hand, 80% of, te of Canadian teens rarely or never use the internet with a parent or other adult, and only half of students of all ages have said that they have learned about issues related to privacy, cyberbullying, and online safety from their parents. In addition, between 2005 and 2013, the percentage of Canadian students reporting family rules about getting together in person with somebody they met online declined by 30%, having sites they are not allowed to visit declined by 22%, and not talking to strangers declined by 17%. So it appears that parents may become more relaxed with respect to online safety over time. I'd like to begin this next section by showing a brief video clip. Um, I'd like you to pay particular attention to both the statements and the graphics and think about your children and um, Imagine that this is a day in their lives. Maybe then you will see what you wait for me. When you ask her name, 
So that video was a brief representation of what I'm going to talk about in the next section of this webinar and why this topic is so important. Bullying and cyberbullying can have profound negative consequences on young people, but the role that technology and social relationships have in the lives of our youth are not going to change. What needs to change is our role as adults in helping youth understand the importance of social relationships and the value of all people. Adults are sometimes confused about what actually constitutes bullying. All forms of bullying, including cyberbullying, are characterized by three features. First, bullying is repeated in nature, so this means that one act of aggression or name calling is not considered bullying. Second, bullying is intentional. Sometime, uh, sometimes young people do accidentally harm other people. These incidents are not considered bullying. Third, bullying occurs in relationships characterized by an imbalance of power. This power imbalance may relate to physical size or social status, but it may also be created by things such as gender, age, social class, or technological proficiency. Over time, the bully becomes even more powerful and the victim becomes increasingly less powerful. Accordingly, adult intervention is often required to overcome this imbalance of power. Following from the characteristics uh, that I just mentioned, the Ontario Ministry of Education defines cyberbullying as aggressive and repeated behavior committed by electronic means within the context of a relationship where a power imbalance exists and, importantly, where the behavior causes or should be known to cause harm, fear, or distress to another individual or where the behavior creates a negative environment at school for another individual. Although cyberbullying is less common than other traditional forms of bullying, like schoolyard bullying, um, such as physical or verbal bullying, it still affects a very large number of young people. The results of a number of studies suggest that at least one in five students is the victim of cyberbullying, but this number may be as high as four out of five, 
In addition, most students say that they either know somebody who has been cyberbullied or they have witnessed cyberbullying themselves. Girls are more likely than boys to report being cyberbullied, although this may be because boys are less likely to actually admit to being bullied. Nevertheless, the type of cyberbullying that does occur is also gendered. Girls are often cyberbullied because of their appearance or their real or perceived sexual prowess. And boys are often cyberbullied because of their athletic ability and their real or perceived sexual orientation. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered students are also much more likely to be bullied and cyberbullied than other youth. And finally, and quite problematically, fewer than half of all young people who are cyberbullied tell an adult about their experiences. Oftentimes when we send an email or post a message on somebody's wall, we forget that there's a real person behind that other screen. However, it is becoming increasingly clear that there are real offline consequences to online behavior. Young people who are bullied often feel angry, frustrated, and sad. They are three times more likely than non-bullied youth to be anxious or depressed, and they are two times more likely to have attempted suicide not thought about suicide, but to have actually attempted it. Youth who are cyberbullied are also at a much greater risk for school problems like fighting, che uh, cheating, skipping classes, being suspended, and having poor grades, and for alcohol and drug use and abuse. Young people who are cyberbullied are also um, often involved in traditional bullying in some way, either as the victim, the perpetrator, or both. Altogether, fewer than 30% of youth who have been cyberbullied reported that they were not affected by the incident. You might be wondering where cyberbullying is most likely to occur, and the unfortunate reality is that there are no limits. Cyberbullying occurs across social media platforms, via cell phones, uh, uh, via email, in internet forums and message boards and so forth. Cyberbullying occurs across social classes and geographic regions. It happens in cities and it happens in the smallest rural communities. It happens in, um, you know, it happens everywhere. It happens in Canada's most remote, remote northern communities. It's a fallacy to think cyberbullying doesn't happen here. Uh, trust me, it does. Given the frequency with which it is discussed in the media uh, and its sometimes close relationship to cyberbullying, I'd like to take a moment or two to discuss sexting. Sexting refers to the use of communication technology to send or receive sexually explicit messages and photos. Because sexting is such a new phenomenon, we don't yet have very good data about how common it is. Uh, most surveys come from online polls or media-generated studies, so prevalence rates vary quite widely, often finding that between 1% and 31% of youth are involved in sexting. One of the few studies on sexting that has been conducted and published by scientists reported that 15% of high school teens have received a sext and one-third knew people who had been involved in sexting. Another study found that 28% uh, of teens have sent a naked picture of themselves to somebody else and that boys and girls were equally likely to have sent a sext message. Teens and especially teen girls are often pressured to send naked pictures of themselves to others. One study found that almost 70% of teen girls have been asked to send a sext message compared to just 42% of boys. And of those who have been asked to send a naked picture of themselves to somebody else, almost all girls and more than half of boys reported being bothered by the request. Many young people consider sexting to be a safe method um, or a, a method of safe sex, and they send sext messages to their, po their partner to avoid pressures or to delay a sexual encounter. For example, if their boyfriend is pressuring them to have sex, many girls will send a sext to satisfy him for the time being and to delay the initiation of a sexual relationship. Unfortunately, what they often forget 
is that once they have sent that picture, they lose control of it. And oftentimes, or sometimes anyways, when relationships end, their partner then forwards that message to many, which may be hundreds or even thousands of other people. More and more, often the popular app Snapchat, which the logo is that uh, ghost in the yellow box that you see in the lower left corner of your screen, uh, is being used to sext. With Snapchat, you can text photos to your friends, but they'll only be able to see that picture for a maximum of 10 seconds and then it disappears. So many young people think that this is safe, as a safe way to send nude or sexually suggestive pictures or, um, to other people, believing that after 10 seconds the message will be gone forever. However, what they forget is how easy it is to take a screen capture on a smartphone, which I mean at most it takes two seconds, uh, probably much less than that, and when this happens the picture lives on forever. The person, the recipient has it on their phone for good. Many youth also think of sexting as a form of normalized behavior. Uh, it's just a natural part of their lives. In fact, it has become so normal that you'll often hear teens talk about sending nudes in passing and many boys compete with one another to see who can acquire the most pictures. Um, and in some ways it is just another form of uh, teen sexual expression. However, the consequences of sexting can be severe. Young people's likelihood of having started dating, having had sex, having had multiple sex partners, and having used drugs or alcohol before sex are all greater among those who have sent, received, or asked for a sext when compared to those not engaged in sexting. In addition, sexting is considered child pornography. Taking the picture is the creation of child pornography, sending them is the distribution of child pornography, and having them on one's phone or computer is the possession of child pornography. The Canadian government, uh, federal government, recently introduced legislation to clarify child pornography laws and clamp down on sexting. And in the US, several young people are registered sex offenders because they forwarded a picture to their boyfriend or girlfriend, of their boyfriend or girlfriend to others. The police recommend that if your child receives a sex message, they should inform an adult immediately and contact the police. There is uh, some information hidden in the pictures uh, that the police need for investigative purposes, so they generally suggest not deleting it until they have been able to extract this information. Um, so it, it's best to contact them if you find one of these on your child's phone. You may have heard of the tragic story of Amanda Todd. When Amanda was in grade seven, um, she moved in with her father and she used online video chats to meet new people. During one chat, a stranger convinced her to flash him. Unbeknownst to Amanda, the stranger took a screen capture of this and used the image to torment Amanda for several years. He created multiple Facebook accounts using the image as his profile picture. He befriended her peers and family so that they could see the image. Amanda was ruthlessly bullied online and offline, and she became severely depressed. Each time she switched schools, the, young, the man would resurface and spread the picture again. Uh, quite famously, in September 2012, Amanda posted a nine-minute video to YouTube in which she used a series of flashcards to tell the world her story. That video went viral, um, and as of uh, this February of 2014, had been viewed by almost 9 million people. Sadly, however, on October 10th, 2012, at just 15 years of age, Amanda took her own life to escape the torment she was experiencing. Shortly after her daughter's death, Carol Todd said, what goes on the internet stays on the internet. It's there forever and it damages lives. This is important for all of us to keep in mind, but especially our children. Once something is posted online, we can never get it back. It's simply too easy to copy forward or save anything from the internet. Even if the original image or post is deleted, many, many others may exist. Before we do anything online, 
we should be asking ourselves, am I comfortable with everybody in the world seeing this? Given the risks that are associated with cyberbullying and sexting, it's important for parents to watch for a variety of signs that might suggest their children are involved one way or the other. There are many possible signs and symptoms of involvement in cyberbullying. So these are just a few of the most common. Uh, there are also other possibilities and other possible explanations for these signs and behaviors. Ultimately, you know your children best, but if you notice these things occurring, it may be worth talking to your child just to ensure that everything's okay. Signs that your child may be being cyberbullied include them suddenly stopping using computers or cell phones, appearing nervous or agitated when an email or text message appears, not uh, wanting to go to school and appearing angry, frustrated, or depressed after using his or her cell phone or computer. Young people who are being cyberbullied also often do not want to talk about what they are doing on their cell phone and they may become abnormally withdrawn from friends and family. On the other hand, there are some things you can watch for that may suggest your child is cyberbullying somebody else. Um, these include them quickly switching screens or closing programs when you walk by, becoming unusually upset if his or her computer or cell phone privileges are restricted, and avoiding discussions about what he or she is doing with technology. Children who appear to be using multiple accounts or have accounts that they do not think you know about may also be engaged in cyberbullying. The last few slides may have been upsetting and they may have made you feel a little helpless, but fortunately there are many things that parents can do to protect their children in electronic environments. So I'm going to discuss a few of those now. Most importantly, and this probably seems very obvious um, and it's probably not something that even needs to be said for the type of parents that um, attend presentations like this, but it's worth just reiterating uh, one more time, I think. But the most important thing, of course, is to love and support your child. This is absolutely the most important thing that children need. And if they're being bullied, they are vulnerable and they require your support more than ever. It's also important to remember that it's not their fault that they're being bullied. They probably didn't do anything to bring this on. Uh, and really, they just need to know that you'll support them through this difficult time. If your child has told you that they're being bullied, you should be very proud. Very few young people report bullying to an adult. And at the same time, though, don't be upset if they told another adult, but they didn't tell you. The key is that they have somebody that they trust that they can speak to about this. Children should not have to deal with bullying or cyberbullying on their own. And as I mentioned earlier, the power differential is often difficult to overcome without adult intervention. So no matter what, it's important to take your child seriously and do whatever you can to help them address the problem. This is some good news. Uh, parents are the most important influence on their children. Although there are other influences, yours remains the strongest even throughout their teenage years when you might feel as though they are never listening to you. Most importantly, parents can influence, or parents' influence can constrain children's choices in terms of friends, hobbies, and activities. This is important in relation to media. Children will be exposed to some content you probably don't want them to access. But there is no reason why parents cannot control their children's exposure. For example, if you put a TV in your child's bedroom and have no rules about what they can watch and for how long, um, you know, then that parent might not have a right to complain about the evil influence of TV on their child. And the same is true for computers. As a parent, you can use parental controls and monitoring programs to restrict your children's access to content and limit their time on computers. If you do use monitoring software, um, it's important to explain to your child that you have installed the software and that it is for their protection, not to spy on them. According to Lawrence Steinberg, an expert on parenting and the author of several books on the subjects, um, he 
asks, are you concerned about the potential negative influence of peers of the media on your child? If so, don't throw your hands up in despair or shirk your responsibility. Assert your authority as a parent. That's what parents are for. So that's what Steinberg, an expert on this uh, topic, suggests. Completely restricting access to technology or social media like Facebook is not an effective parenting strategy. Strategy if you do not have a well thought out rationale for doing so. If children believe that a rule is reasonable, they are more likely to, comp to comply even if they don't like the rule. For example, Facebook's terms of use state that all registered users must be at least 13 years old and parents could perhaps cite this rule when explaining why their 10 year old cannot have Facebook. Many children are tech savvy though and they will get around your rules about technology if they want to when they are old enough. Therefore a beneficial approach is to teach young people how to interact safely and appropriately with technology. For example reiterate to your children that giving out their phone number to friends online is fine but giving it to strangers or posting it on social media profiles or websites is not. The behavior that you model for your children matters because children learn by watching us. Have you noticed that you may have many of the same attitudes, opinions, and habits that your parents had when you were growing up, even though you swore you would be different? I recently realized that. Observing adults is one of the most important ways that children learn about the world. Infants look for signals about, the, about their safety and well-being, but older adolescents continue to watch and learn from their parents as well. If a child's parents always resolve disputes by yelling, the child learns that this is an appropriate way to resolve disputes. As a result, the saying, do as I say, not as I do, is very ineffective advice. Children will do what you do. We often try to get our children involved in our interests, but it's also important for parents to take an interest in their children's interests as well. This creates opportunities for you to connect with each other, spend time together, form a bond, and correct, uh, correct mistakes and guide decision making. This includes taking an interest in their online and offline activities. If you're not comfortable with cell phones, technology, or social media, something as simple as asking your child to teach you how to use these forms of new media can be empowering for children. It's an opportunity to connect with your children and it's an excellent opportunity to learn about how your children use these things. Lawrence Steinberg, that parenting expert that I mentioned a moment ago, also says that once your child begin spending time away from home, you should always be able to answer these three questions. Where is my child? Who is my child with? And what is my child doing? Most parents understand the importance of asking these questions and I would suggest that most parents, especially those listening to this webinar, can answer these questions most of the time. However, we often forget to ask these same questions when children are engaged in the online world. What website is my child visiting? Who is my child talking to? What is my child doing? Can you answer these questions about your child's online activities as easily as you can about their offline activities? If you can't answer these questions, it doesn't mean that your child is getting into trouble, but repeated poor monitoring greatly increases children's risk for problem behaviors. At the same time, it's also important to give your children independence and let them make mistakes, especially as they get older. Although it's important to know what is going on in your child's life, with older teenagers you don't need to know the specific details of every phone call or text message, as hard as it might be to accept that, and I can understand that difficulty. I really would like to reiterate as well that you don't have to have all of the answers and you do not have to do everything yourself. You might consider talking to other parents to see what they've done when their children have been cyberbullied. There are many online resources that describe other parents' experiences and often offer suggestions on to how uh, on how to deal with cyberbullying. If it's safe to do so, some cyberbullying incidents may also be resolved by speaking directly to the bully's parents. It's often a good idea to contact your child's school. 
Bullying in all forms often affects young people at school. Schools have expertise in dealing with these issues and they may be off able to offer some guidance as to uh, things you can do at home to help your children through this difficult time. And as of February 2008, so for quite a while now, all bullying, even that which originates off school property, can lead to suspensions if it impacts the child at school in any way. In Ontario, the Keeping Our Kids Safe at School Act includes three major requirements relevant for cyberbullying. First, all board employees must report to the principal if they become aware that a student may have engaged in behavior that could be punishable by suspension or expulsion. Second, principals must contact the parents of victims of such incidents unless the victim is 18 years of age or older or if doing so would place the victim at risk for further harm from the parent. And third, board employees who work directly with students must respond to all incidents that have a negative impact on school climate. Along with speaking to other parents, if the bullying is severe, it may be worthwhile contacting the police. Cyberbullying can be considered criminal. Uh, for example, harassing, harassing or threatening others is a crime. If you're unsure if a crime has occurred, contact the police anyways. They will tell you if there's nothing that they can do. And even if the bully is too young to be formally charged, the police can write reports so that they have a record if the behavior continues later when the bully is older. Collaborative responses to cyberbullying are often the most effective. I'd like to take a moment to offer some additional strategies that parents might consider using to help protect your children in the online world. I'll use the acronym PARENTS to make these strategies easier to remember. The P stands for Participate and Protect. There are a number of excellent resources available for parents to aid in protecting their children. As parents, it's important that web and cell phone activities are monitored just as you would monitor regular daily activities. While these are not the only resources available, they are a good starting point because they provide parents with a springboard for conversations with their children. Whenever parental monitoring software is used, I strongly encourage parents to discuss the software and the rationale for using it with their children. Online Family Norton is an excellent suite of parental monitoring software for computers. It's free and it allows parents to create various accounts for, the, for children of different ages, set different restrictions for multiple children, and monitor what children do online. What's particularly nice about this program is that because it is web-based, you can access it at any time. If, for example, you have set a one-hour uh, limit on Internet internet activity for your child, but she contacts you at work one evening saying that she needs to be on longer to do research for a school project, you can log in remotely and give her additional time. You can also remotely check to ensure that she has been doing homework and not spending her time on Facebook. If you're using Windows 8, which is Microsoft's new operating system, a powerful family safety program is built right in that has many of the same features as online Family Norton. Many smartphones also now come equipped with parental monitoring capabilities. iPhones, for example, allow parents to set restrictions on what their children can do by going into settings and then general and then restrictions. So that's settings, general, and then restrictions. And with this feature, you can disable things like location services, which allow apps to identify your child's whereabouts. You can prevent your children from being able to download apps, and you can disable various other features. Other free and paid parental monitoring software is also available for cell phones, and a simple Google search will provide you with many options. For more information on protecting your children online, um, I would also encourage everyone to visit the Canadian Centre for Child Protection's website at protectchildren.ca. It's important for parents to assess the appropriateness of children's online activity. Uh, the internet is a wonderful tool, but it must be used responsibly. Its purpose is to entertain, share, educate, and communicate ideas and information, but it also has the possibility to affect social change. 
it's important for young people to become more active producers online rather than passive consumers. The websites on this slide provide some opportunities for engaging in social issues and actively producing content. For example, Think MTV is a social networking site that promotes youth involvement in social issues. Taking IT Global is a social networking site based out of Toronto that is designed to connect youth around the world with the goal of inspiring and informing our youth. Uh, similarly, Discovery Kids is a website that was created by chil or created for children with an emphasis on real life adventures, nature and science. So these are all safe, fun and powerful websites that young people can engage with. The key to providing safe, a safe media environment for our children is being proactive. Although the task might seem daunting, parents should research the media that their children are consuming and use the resources available to ensure their safety. A variety of websites include information and resources where parents can learn more about internet safety. Given the potentially negative mental health outcomes associated with cyberbullying, uh, I've also included links to mental health resources. Lastly, I understand that it can be difficult to stay on top of the language that are, is used by young people. Uh, those short forms and acronyms are always changing. And websites like teenangels.org and netlingo.com describe what these acronyms actually mean. And best of all, these sites are updated regularly as those languages change. Thankfully, there are many agencies and organizations out there that are making combating cyberbullying and abusive digital communication a priority. There are several great resources available for parents to use when educating their children about cyber safety and helping them evaluate their online interactions and behaviors. For example, That's Not Cool is a website where you can go to learn more about drawing a digital line. On this site, um, visitors learn about how to deal with controlling, disrespecting, or pressuring peers and dating partners in the digital world. TextEd is an interactive website that teaches Canadian teens to be safe, responsible, and respecting users of texting technologies. A Thin Line, which is managed by MTV, raises awareness about the thin line between public and private love and abuse and being helpful or hurtful. Youth can take a survey about their own digital line on that website and if the results show that they may be crossing it, they are provided with strategies to adjust their behavior. And Common Sense Media um, is an absolutely wonderful website that includes a number of resources and ratings for a variety of types of media. So uh, all of these websites are worth um, having a look at. Netiquette, or Internet Etiquette, is a movement dedicated to making the Internet safe and secure by establishing a set of rules and guidelines. Netiquette is important, and young people need to realize that their etiquette in real life should be a benchmark for their online behaviors and interactions. Young people, and some adults as well, uh, need to remember that everyone has access to the Internet, including family members, school officials, potential employers, and law enforcement. Youth should assume that anything they put on the internet has the potential to be found, circulated, and saved. Just because youth participate from behind a screen does not mean that their digital behaviors are not a reflection of who they are. It's just as important to treat people with courtesy and respect online as it is in real life. Some guidelines for complying with netiquette include treating others like you want to be treated, respecting others' opinions and cultures, and being genuine online. Remember that when you communicate with someone online, they can't see your face to tell if you're teasing them or being sarcastic. Just as you have the right not to be harassed by others, others have the right not to be harassed by you. Also remember that the internet is not censored, so if you come across something that you disagree with or find offensive, leave the area. It's not worth starting a war simply because you don't agree with something. Finally, inappropriate behaviors including hacking, illegal downloading, plagiarism, gossiping, bullying, and threatening others is just as unethical online as it is offline. 
these are some suggestions um, for ways to respond if your child is experiencing cyberbullying or digital harassment. Again, leave the area or stop the activity. Never reply to harassing messages. Save and print the messages. They make very good evidence. And we always want to encourage young people to tell a trusted adult. Block the sender across social media platforms, on, on cell phones, and other digital communication devices. Check your own settings to ensure your privacy is strong enough. Consider changing your phone number or email address if the harassment is severe. And know the various policies and user agreements of the sites and services that you use. They usually prohibit harassment. Again, meet with school officials and ask them for help in resolving the situation. Report the problem to websites on which the bullying is occurring and if necessary involve the police, especially if your child's safety is threatened. Social networking is an important aspect of many young people's lives. So I'd like to take uh, a moment to discuss approaches to safe social networking. Following this, of course, cannot ensure that you will be safe 100% of the time, but they can provide a good starting point. Whenever possible, avoid using real names on social networking sites. Consider using a first name and a middle name or some other nickname. Do not post personal information such as your age, school, location, interests, or activities. Keep social networking pages discreet so that you do not help someone find out things about you that you don't want them to know. Never provide your email or phone number on social networking sites. This information merely provides bullies with another avenue to bully somebody through. Ensure your profile is secure and privacy settings are being utilized. Facebook's recommended settings are not that strong, so customize them to make them more effective. Avoid posting pictures or videos whenever possible. These can be downloaded and shared with other people and information included in those images or videos might be able to tell other people your child's location. Online friends should absolutely be offline friends. Do not accept friends that you don't know. And lastly, monitor your friends' profiles and ask them to remove content that includes you but that you are not comfortable with having posted online. If they are your friend, they will comply. If they don't, then it might be time to reevaluate that friendship. I'm going to show one more video here that highlights some of the differences between adults and youth's technology use. Again, the key thing to remember is that as a parent, you don't have to have all of the answers. Your children may know more about technology than you do, and that's okay. Many children feel empowered teaching their parents how to use technology. If this isn't something that you yourself are comfortable with, you can still parent just like you would offline, and you should do this. Let your children know that you care about them, make them feel comfortable coming to you with their problems, and when they do, try to find a solution or seek help from others. There are a variety of online resources available to parents and to teachers, some of which I've already mentioned. Media Smarts has an array of information about digital literacy, cyberbullying, and cybersecurity for parents and youth. The Canadian government's Need Help Now website, which is an initiative of the Canadian Centre for Child Protection, is a valuable resource for young people and parents affected by sexting. Likewise, PrevNet, the Promoting Relationships and Eliminating Violence Network, is a Canadian consortium of researchers and community agencies working towards eliminating bullying and fostering healthy relationships. Their website includes a great deal of research as well as resources for teachers, parents, and youth. And lastly, in the fourth R community of practice, and I should mention that uh, I work for 
the KMH Center for Prevention Science and the 4th R is one of our programs. There's a community of practice that you can go to to find a variety of resources for parents and educators uh, as well as links to other informational webinars about youth and healthy relationships. The community of practice is designed to be a forum for adults to get together and share resources, stories, and tips to help youth build healthy relationships. And um, so it's certainly worth checking out as well. So with that,